Thank you. So it's April 2002. I leave Boston for Armenia. I, idealistic, patriotic, optimistic, and also extremely naive about what I was getting myself into. So, as luck would have it, I, I land a job at a software company as a team leader. And I couldn't have been happier. I met a bunch of people just like me who moved to Armenia to make it a better place. Things were going great. Five months later, my mind has disintegrated. My cognitive processes are shot. I have short-term memory loss. I live in complete confusion. I'm a zombie. So for some perspective, imagine the morning when you wake up, you feel a little groggy. Maybe you're hungover. Uh, you're having a little you know, trouble focusing. Maybe you woke up um, after a bad dream. You're a little disoriented about where you are. And you need a few minutes to get your bearings so you can move on with your morning routine. Now imagine feeling that way 12 hours a day, all week long. I felt like my brain was burnt out. I couldn't comprehend anything. I couldn't concentrate. I couldn't process thoughts. My mind was a blank slate all day long. I was constantly scrambling to collect my thoughts, to focus. But I couldn't. I would read an email 20 times and still not comprehend anything. So then I would take notes and then I would refer, and then I would forget what they referred to. I couldn't perform my assignments at work because I didn't know how to proceed. So I would sit anxiously in my corner, perplexed. I lived and moved in slow motion. And it was all so devastating and exhausting. I would ask myself, what am I supposed to do? Maybe an answer would come and then I would forget. Then I would have to ask myself again, what am I supposed to do? And then I would forget over and over and over and over again. That was my hell. My mind felt as though it was, it was submerged in a thick fog and I was paralyzed emotionally. And it felt as though I was detached from reality, that I was standing beside myself and observing. And well, you know how some people, um, I mean, in general, like to play mind games with each other. They like to, uh, you know, seeing, you know, and asking, what books have you read? Um, what do you know about Soviet history? What do you play chess? All sorts of questions. They always ask me if I read Nietzsche, I remember. They always ask me, Christian, have you read Nietzsche? And they would sit there brooding like this. And then after a while, I would, my inability to say yes, um, I would take it to heart. And I began to think that I was stupid, that I never knew anything, that I never even knew anything because I could not access the information that I had known. It was as if I was a little boy lost in the world of grown-ups and everyone around me was a genius. And then I started pacing for no reason. I would just start pacing like this back and forth. There was no reason why I was doing it, it just happened. And I'll be doing this, you know, just started happening. And then I would start making these weird gesturing movements for no reason. It was just part of my thing. It became second nature to do this. And the more this was happening, the more isolated I wanted to become from society. But no matter how terrible I felt, there was always a small voice inside me that said, you're going to beat this thing. Tomorrow you're back to your old self. And every two weeks, I would feel elated. Things would start coming back together mentally. 
be able to plan and um, do things, you know, like eat normally and think. And then just as abruptly, uh, the fog would start rolling in and um, the same horror. So after a while, I, co-workers began to sense that something was wrong with the guy from America. So they began to talk down to me and snigger behind my back. And they, you know, I want to defend myself. I want to, you know, yell at them. I, I didn't want anybody to talk to me that way. But I can't do anything about it because I'm paralyzed. The words don't come out. And I had to live with this uh, feeling that people were, that people were resenting me day after day. Only one person, a close friend to this day, uh, bothered to ask me if he could help, uh, if he could do anything for me. They showed no empathy. And I think that's due to this uh, general misperception of uh, mental illness in Armenia, uh, having gone crazy, as they say. So my situation got to the point to where uh, I would forget to bathe regularly or change my clothes even. And then uh, the chanting began. So while I was pacing, I would start. So I would be pacing, what's wrong with me? Why can't I do that? And I would say, uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. Just over and over and over again. Uh, and this was frightening. So, uh... Another uh, repat from Boston, a friend of mine, decided that I had to quit my job and go home because the decision-making process was gone. I couldn't make any decisions on my own. And he didn't for me. And in retrospect, I don't know how I survived that flight, rocking to myself my and rocking. So back in Boston, I'm diagnosed with severe major depression about in about 20 seconds. I remember feeling profound guilt that I let Armini down, that my co-workers down. The same bastards would turn on me. So I was admitted to the psych outpatient services program at Cambridge Hospital. The best around. It didn't take long for my caretakers to, to try to make me understand that it was my epilepsy that was a problem. So flashback to 1991 when I suffered a grand mal seizure when walking our family dog around a pond late one afternoon. It turns out that I had what was known as photosensitive epilepsy. Photosensitive epilepsy. And I had been having absence seizures my whole life without even understanding what they were. So my seizure to the last a split second. Uh, during which I would sort of lose consciousness. And I would hear snippets of conversation or see or, or hear music even. And the more frequently these uh, seizures would happen, the more disoriented I would become. Uh, they would happen on the school bus early in the morning when the sun was flickering through the trees or bright supermarkets. And I thought it was a normal thing. I thought that happens to everybody when the lights bother them. 50 million people around the world have epilepsy, according to the World Health Organization. And three out of 100 epileptics have photosensitive epilepsy. 1.5 out of 1,000 people in Armenia have epilepsy. And 1.6 out of 1,000 children do. Three-fourths of people with epilepsy in developing countries may not be receiving the proper care that they need. So for 10 years, I was on anti-seizure medication until with the help of my doctor, I tapered off because there was a genuine concern that it would cause liver damage. And it was also suppressing my ambition. So I started taking herbal supplements 
uh, because I was hoping, uh, hoping that I was because some people, because some people with reflux epilepsy grow out of it by the age of 30. But at Cambridge Hospital, even the state that I was in, I still refused anti-seizure medication. So they convinced me to start an antidepressant, but that would take eight weeks to kick in. So my condition actually degraded before it began to improve. So after all, I went to start taking effect. I, um, the pacing, the gesturing, I think the gesturing started to go away. But I still had to be told what to do. And uh, my close family and friends were right beside me. Their support couldn't have been greater. And then one day, after I intentionally skipped a dose out of frustration, which is a no-no, you're not supposed to do that, uh, I uh, entered the pit of hell. And I remember it was a long night. It was a long night. And I was, uh, after I took the next dose, as it was early in the morning, I remember, I was taking a hot shower, and I realized that I, I realized that I had to resume taking anti-seizure medication. So I started doing some research online, and the med that I found was the very same one that my psychiatrist did. So four days after uh, taking the medication, the fog lifted. I could start thinking again, comprehending, and functioning. I was all better, or so I thought. So this was spring of 2003. So now I am high on life. I feel like Superman. My confidence has gone through the roof. I feel I can do anything. And I had to keep busy. Every, uh, every, uh, every second of the day as if I was making up for lost time. So I decided to become a chain smoker because, you know, and um, basically I wanted to, now that I felt I was well and strong again, rebel. I want to rebel against my illness, against all the tormentors from my past, even against myself. And I just want to prove to everyone how great I was now and how confident that I was, that I was a real man. And I was going to let anybody uh, get to me again. So this was an emotional pain I was dealing with. I also decided to be honest and upfront with everyone. That was my new uh, mantra. So if I, would, if I was in love with someone, I would tell them. If they irritated me, they would know about it. So essentially, I was bipolar. And that lasted throughout 2003. And it wasn't until I didn't last the full day I had a new job that, that I had to, that I had to take control of my life. That's when I realized it. And I just want to say that I don't know what I would have done, done with the love and support of my parents. They was always there for me. When I said, now, when I finally reached a plane of stability, I went through months of soul searching to discover who I was and what I wanted to do with my life. Because of the illness, many of my personal relationships were permanently damaged. I lost friends. And the pain I was dealing with now, that was that of shame, guilt, and deep regret about what I had said to others, about what I had said to others, and the memories were raw. And during this time, the, the question kept nagging me, what the hell happened to me? 
in my research, I couldn't find a direct connection between depression and epilepsy. I read of a condition known as status epilepticus, whereby the patient is seizing continuously, continuously immobilized. But then I began to think, didn't that more or less happen to me? So after weeks of research online on what must have been the 20th search results page, I find a paper called Absence Status Epilepticus by C.P. Poniatopoulos, who is a world-renowned neurologist. And this was my eureka moment. The paper detailed every single symptom that I had had, from the automatisms to the feeling of being removed from myself, the lack of living in confusion. Everything was there, as if the paper was written especially for me. So my illness had a name. This also meant that uh, others shared my pain, and they, they too, like me, recovered. Moreover, I was alive, and it was time to move on with my life and be happy. So when I'm confident that uh, I'm well, I decided to uh, return to Armenia. This was in the fall of 2004. I forged relationships, had some amazing adventures. I listened to a lot of people writing about it all on my blogs and my articles. I wrote a novel about my experiences. And I'm married, have a son with another on the way. These are all things that 10 years ago I never thought would ever happen. So we all go through some pain in our lives, whether it's physical, mental, or emotional. Once the root cause is determined and treatment begins, you can move on by reconciling with the pain, embracing it, and loving life. With epilepsy and certainly mental illness, you need to have the courage to dispel misconceptions uh, by talking about it. Others need to know that people who are once very ill can live productive, successful lives. The stigma that, oh, he went nuts, he's done, has to be broken down because it's simply not true and that comes from education and empathy. The recovery of my sickness took 18 months. Um, the memories haunted me for years, every day. Now, a decade later, I hardly remember the hell that I went through. And I have my son to thank for that. Thank you.